Herbert West, Reanimator. Six. The Tomb Legions. When Dr. Herbert West disappeared a year ago, the Boston police questioned me closely. They suspected that I was holding something back and perhaps suspected graver things, but I could not tell them the truth, because they would not have believed it. They knew, indeed, that West had been connected with activities beyond the credence of ordinary men, for his hideous experiments in the reanimation of dead bodies had long been too extensive to admit of perfect secrecy, but the final soul-shattering catastrophe held elements of demoniac fantasy which made even me doubt the reality of what I saw. I was West's closest friend and only confidential assistant. We had met years before, in medical school, and from the first I had shared his terrible researches. He had slowly tried to perfect a solution which, injected into the veins of the newly deceased, would restore life, a labor demanding an abundance of fresh corpses and therefore involving the most unnatural actions. Still more shocking were the products of some of the experiments. Grisly masses of flesh that had been dead, but that West waked to a blind, brainless, nauseous animation. These were the usual results, for in order to reawaken the mind, it was necessary to have specimens so absolutely fresh that no decay could possibly affect the delicate brain cells. This need for very fresh corpses had been West's moral undoing. They were hard to get, and one awful day he had secured his specimen while it was still alive and vigorous. A struggle, a needle and a powerful alkaloid had transformed it to a very fresh corpse, and the experiment had succeeded for a brief and memorable moment. But West had emerged with a soul calloused and seared, and a hardened eye which sometimes glanced with a kind of hideous and calculating appraisal at men of especially sensitive brain and especially vigorous physique. Toward the last I became acutely afraid of West, for he began to look at me that way. People did not seem to notice his glances, but they noticed my fear, and after his disappearance used that as a basis for some absurd suspicions. West, in reality, was more afraid than I, for his abominable pursuits entailed a life of furtiveness and dread of every shadow. Partly it was the police he feared, but sometimes his nervousness was deeper and more nebulous, touching on certain indescribable things into which he had injected a morbid life, and from which he had not seen that life depart. He usually finished his experiments with a revolver, but a few times he had not been quick enough. There was that first specimen, on whose rifled grave marks of clawing were later seen. There was also that Arkham Professor's body, which had done cannibal things before it had been captured and thrust unidentified into a madhouse cell at Sefton, where it beat the walls for sixteen years. Most of the other possibly surviving results were things less easy to speak of for in later years West's scientific zeal had degenerated to an unhealthy and fantastic mania, and he had spent his chief skill in vitalizing not entire human bodies, but isolated parts of bodies, or parts joined to organic matter other than human. It had become fiendishly disgusting by the time he disappeared. Many of the experiments could not even be hinted at in print. The great war, through which both of us served as surgeons, had intensified this side of West. In saying that West's fear of his specimens was nebulous, I have in mind particularly its complex nature. 
Part of it came merely from knowing of the existence of such nameless monsters, while another part arose from apprehension of the bodily harm they might under certain circumstances do him. Their disappearance added horror to the situation. Of them all, West knew the whereabouts of only one, the pitiful asylum thing. Then there was a more subtle fear, a very fantastic sensation resulting from a curious experiment in the Canadian Army in 1915. West, in the midst of a severe battle, had reanimated Major Sir Eric Morland Clapham Lee, D.S.O., a fellow physician who knew about his experiments and could have duplicated them. The head had been removed so that the possibilities of quasi-intelligent life in the trunk might be investigated. Just as the building was wiped out by a German shell, there had been a success. The trunk had moved intelligently, and, unbelievable to relate, we were both sickeningly sure that articulate sounds had come from the detached head as it lay in a shadowy corner of the laboratory. The shell had been merciful, in a way, but West could never feel as certain as he wished, that we too were the only survivors. He used to make shuddering conjectures about the possible actions of a headless physician with the power of reanimating the dead. West's last quarters were in a venerable house of much elegance overlooking one of the oldest burying grounds in Boston. He had chosen the place for purely symbolic and fantastically aesthetic reasons, since most of the interments were of the colonial period and therefore of little use to a scientist seeking very fresh bodies. The laboratory was in a sub-cellar secretly constructed by imported workmen and contained a huge incinerator for the quiet and complete disposal of such bodies, or fragments and synthetic mockeries of bodies, as might remain from the morbid experiments and unhallowed amusements of the owner. During the excavation of this cellar, the workmen had struck some exceedingly ancient masonry, undoubtedly connected with the old burying ground yet far too deep to correspond with any known sepulchre therein. After a number of calculations, West decided that it represented some secret chamber beneath the tomb of the Averills, where the last interment had been made in 1768. I was with him when he studied the nitrous, dripping walls laid bare by the spades and mattocks of the men and was prepared for the gruesome thrill which would attend the uncovering of centuried grave secrets. But for the first time, West's new timidity conquered his natural curiosity, and he betrayed his degenerating fibre by ordering the masonry left intact and plastered over. Thus it remained till that final hellish night, part of the walls of the secret laboratory. I speak of West's decadence, but must add that it was a purely mental and intangible thing. Outwardly he was the same to the last, calm, cold, slight, and yellow-haired, with spectacled blue eyes and a general aspect of youth which years and fears seemed never to change. He seemed calm even when he thought of that clawed grave and looked over his shoulder even when he thought of that carnivorous thing that gnawed and poured at Sefton Bars. The end of Herbert West began one evening in our joint study, when he was dividing his curious glance between the newspaper and me. A strange headline item had struck at him from the crumpled pages, and a nameless titan claw had seemed to reach down through sixteen years. Something fearsome and incredible had happened at Sefton Asylum fifty miles away, stunning the neighborhood and baffling the police. In the small hours of the morning, a body of silent men had entered the grounds and their leader had aroused the attendants. 
He was a menacing military figure who talked without moving his lips and whose voice seemed almost ventriloquially connected with an immense black case he carried. His expressionless face was handsome to the point of radiant beauty, but had shocked the superintendent when the hall light fell on it, for it was a wax face with eyes of painted glass. Some nameless accident had befallen this man. A larger man guided his steps, a repellent hulk whose bluish face seemed half eaten away by some unknown malady. The speaker had asked for the custody of the cannibal monster committed from Arkham sixteen years before, and upon being refused, gave a signal which precipitated a shocking riot. The fiends had beaten, trampled, and bitten every attendant who did not flee, killing four and finally succeeding in the liberation of the monster. Those victims who could recall the event without hysteria swore that the creatures had acted less like men than like unthinkable automata guided by the wax-faced leader. By the time help could be summoned, every trace of the men and of their mad charge had vanished. From the hour of reading this item until midnight, West sat almost paralyzed. At midnight, the doorbell rang, startling him fearfully. All the servants were asleep in the attic. So I answered the bell. As I have told the police, there was no wagon in the street, but only a group of strange-looking figures bearing a large square box, which they deposited in the hallway after one of them had grunted in a highly unnatural voice. Express. Prepaid. They filed out of the house with a jerky tread. And as I watched them go, I had an odd idea that they were turning toward the ancient cemetery on which the back of the house abutted. When I slammed the door after them, West came downstairs and looked at the box. It was about two feet square, and bore West's correct name and present address. It also bore the inscription, From Eric Morland Clapham Lee, St. Eloy, Flanders, Six years before, in Flanders, a shelled hospital had fallen upon the headless reanimated trunk of Dr. Clapham Lee, and upon the detached head which, perhaps, had uttered articulate sounds. West was not even excited now. His condition was more ghastly. Quickly he said, It's the finish, but let's incinerate. This. We carried the thing down to the laboratory, listening. I do not remember many particulars. You can imagine my state of mind. But it is a vicious lie to say it was Herbert West's body which I put into the incinerator. We both inserted the whole unopened wooden box, closed the door, and started the electricity. Nor did any sound come from the box, after all. It was West who first noticed the falling plaster on that part of the wall where the ancient tomb masonry had been covered up. I was going to run, but he stopped me. Then I saw a small black aperture, felt a ghoulish wind of ice, and smelled the charnel bowels of a putrescent earth. There was no sound, but just then the electric lights went out, and I saw, outlined against some phosphorescence of the netherworld, a horde of silent toiling things which only insanity, or worse, could create. Their outlines were human, semi-human, fractionally human, and not human at all. The horde was grotesquely heterogeneous. They were removing the stones quietly, one by one, from the centuried wall. And then, as the breach became large enough, 
They came out into the laboratory in single file, led by a stalking thing with a beautiful head made of wax. A sort of mad-eyed monstrosity behind the leader seized on Herbert West. West did not resist or utter a sound. Then they all sprang at him and tore him to pieces before my eyes, bearing the fragments away into that subterranean vault of fabulous abominations. West's head was carried off by the wax-headed leader, who wore a Canadian officer's uniform. As it disappeared, I saw that the blue eyes behind the spectacles were hideously blazing with their first touch of frantic, visible emotion. Servants found me unconscious in the morning. West was gone. The incinerator contained only unidentifiable ashes. Detectives have questioned me, but what can I say? The Sefton tragedy they will not connect with West, not that, nor the men with the box, whose existence they deny. I told them of the vault, and they pointed to the unbroken plaster wall and laughed. So I told them no more. They imply that I am a madman or a murderer. Probably I am mad. But I might not be mad if those accursed tomb legions had not been so silent. 